Welcome to this video lecture. We are continuing our discussion on machine learning and specifically we're going to introduce the concept of artificial neural networks. Artificial neural networks or ANNs are a really important concept to know and understand if you want to uh, be acquainted with machine learning, uh, especially more advanced methods. So neural networks are kind of the basis of many of the very advanced machine learning developments that are happening today. Neural networks are thought of as kind of a universal function approximator where you really don't have to know all that much about the relationships between your inputs and the outputs that you're trying to predict. Uh, it may take some tinkering around to get the right neural network structure, but really a neural network is a thing that you can uh, approximate a, quite a wide variety of different relationships. When we talked about machine learning prior to today, back in module six, if you recall, uh, we had to do quite a bit of feature engineering where we had to find the right nonlinear transformation of some of our inputs in order to get uh, a, a reasonable balance between accuracy and uh, simplicity. Uh, with neural networks, there's still an element of that, but you don't have to do nearly as much uh, feature engineering. You're more tinkering around with sort of the size of your neural network. All right, so what exactly is a neural network? Uh, so a neural network is kind of a, a mathematical um, mimic or analog of a, the, a brain. So in a brain, our brain uh, takes inputs like things that we're seeing or feeling or touching or thinking or just processing and our brain takes those inputs, it processes them through as electrical and chemical signals through all the different neurons in our brain and all those different neurons in our brain um, have been trained and have quote unquote learned uh, all of these different uh, relationships. So neural networks are machine learning's way of trying to mimic that. So typically in a neural network, and I've got one shown here, we pass inputs into, into some kind of model. So here are inputs. That is a, a signal. So this could be a number. In our brain it's an electrical or a chemical signal. Um, so in a, neural, a mathematical neural network, we pass that input through. That is fed to something called a, a neuron. So each one of these circles, we call that a neuron. In neural networks, each one of those neurons is coupled with what's called an activation function. So it might be something just like a linear transformation of the input. So this is a, this inside the neuron is this activation function. But you can have different types of activation functions, like you can have a, a hyperbolic tangent. That's a terrible one. So you can have a hyperbolic tangent. You can have what's called a rectified linear unit, or a ReLU, where you have it's just kind of flat and then um, ramps up. You can have what's called a, a sigmoid, um, and I'll show better versions of these later on. So you can. Basically what this activation function does is it takes that initial signal and it applies some transformation to it. So here we have a linear transformation. Here we have a nonlinear transformation where our signal sort of gets uh, saturated at each end, but here in the middle um, it's there's quite a bit of change in terms of the relationship between the output of that neuron and the input. So uh, by having a bunch of different so these activation functions are just mathematical functions with different parameters built into them, just like uh, coefficients of a polynomial. It's a lot like that. But using a neural network gives us the opportunity to have all kinds of different um, connections here and different functions. So we can have, these are called the neurons, uh, each individual dot. Each set of neurons is called a layer. So here we have the input layer. In the middle we have hidden layers, and that would count all of these. And then at the end we have the output layer. All right, so hopefully this will start to make sense to you very soon. I'm going to show you some of the actual math that happens in a neural network. Okay, so here's a neural network. This is just this is what's called a three-layer perceptron because it has just the input layer, it has one hidden layer, and then it has the output layer. 
So this particular neural network will give us an output Y and inputs U. Uh, we're actually going to use X's instead of U's, but it's just sort of a arbitrary. So this hidden layer is what contains your nonlinear uh, or customized activation functions. All right, so this, these inputs, these are actual data. So this would be actual input data. We feed that into our neural network. Then we have these fitting parameters. So these are called weights. So these weights are our fitting parameters. These are just like coefficients in a polynomial model. So these weights are the thing that we are adjusting to give us the output that we want. Um, this y, uh, these would be our, our targets. So this is the actual data that we're fitting to. So this is our target slash actual data. And then here we have another set of weights. All right, so we've sort of looked at the, the structure of a neural network. So let's try and translate this into math. But first, we're going to look at these different options of uh, activation functions. So when you're building a neural network, you can customize the types of activation functions that you want. So these are some common activation functions. These aren't, these aren't all of the activation functions, but a common one is the hyperbolic tangent function. So this would be the input data coming into that neuron, into that activation function, and then this gives us the output. So what we can do is we can change the shape of this function by, uh, by f when we do fitting. We can use those different weights to either stretch this out or to make it taller or to shift it to one side or another. Uh, this this activation function is called a ReLU or a, uh, a rectified linear unit and you can see it's just linear after the origin and it is just flat or constant at zero before the origin. Uh, sigmoid looks similar in shape to the hyperbolic tangent but it, it's not centered on zero and it doesn't flatten out quite the same way. And then we also have this uh, leaky ReLU unit, which is a, a leaky rectified linear unit, and it, you can just see it has uh, linear after the origin, and then it has still linear before the origin, um, but not quite zero, like in the, uh, the standard ReLU. All right, so when we look again at our neural network, so we saw the different types of activation functions that we could have, so this phi represents the activation function. Um, Let's look at how this translates into math. So we have this omega. This is a function of all these outputs coming from our activation function, and we apply this bigger parameter, the big W. So what our output layer does is it takes in all of the signals coming from the activation functions in our hidden layer. It multiplies them by this, uh, the weight, or this is a fitting parameter. It adds a bias term, and um, it sums up the weights multiplied by the activation functions and adds the bias term, and that gives us our output. Uh, so the hidden layer with our activation function, what it does is it it's a function of our input, or whatever comes from the prior layer. So here we sum up uh, the raw input value, we multiply that by the appropriate weight coming into there. Uh, we add a bias for uh, for each um, for each activation function has this q little q bias term, and then we take the hyperbolic tangent of that, and that is what gives us the output of each of these uh, from each of these activation functions in our hidden layer. So for this simple model, this three-layer perceptron. Uh, we end up getting our overall function, or our y value, is a summation of the combination of all the math here. So essentially, at the end of the day, I don't, it's not important to understand in detail this math, but it is important to understand sort of the structures and how that, it's important to know that there is math behind the scenes of everything that's happening in a neural network. And so a neural network's job is basically just to allow us to customize what type of activation functions, how many layers we're going to have, how many neurons we're going to have in each layer. And with every piece of complexity that we're adding with each layer and each connection and each neuron, we're adding a little bit more complexity 
to our model um, and we're giving it more fitting parameters so that it can fit more and more uh, complex multi-input and multi-output relationships. All right, so we can adjust a lot of different things. So we have P, this is the number of hidden nodes that we might have, and so that just gives us, if we add more hidden nodes in each layer, that just gives us more and more weights to work with and more activation functions to work with. Uh, M is the number of inputs. Uh, U represents each input. We have the little w's that show up here in our activation function. So those are the inner weights on each neuron. And if you remember, this hyperbolic tangent uh, had that kind of S shape. So what these inner weights do is they elongate the function going horizontally. What the outer weight does, that outer weight shows up here on the layer uh, following our, uh, act, our hidden layer. Um, so those elongate each function vertically, and then we are able to add biases with the little q's and the big q's. So at the end of the day, the important thing to remember about neural networks is just that it's a highly customizable uh, black box model where uh, there is math behind the scenes. The math gets, gets pretty complicated when you add more and more complexity to your neural network. And it's rare that you would go back in and actually uh, dig into what all the coefficients are in your model but it is important to understand structurally what this model is all about and what it, that it it's not just a series so not just a diagram of a bunch of different nodes all those different nodes represent actual math and actual equations all right so just an example of a neural network so uh, here's some input data this is relative humidity in green and this is temperature in the dashed blue uh, we want to try, in this particular example, we want to try and predict how much energy is required for a, a set of buildings, and this was from a university campus. So specifically, we are trying to predict electrical load, or the electrical demand, uh, the cooling load or cooling demand, and the heating load for a large university campus. The data that we have available to us are, is the weather, but we also have time and date, and those things can be used as surrogates for uh, if people are occupying those buildings and using the buildings. So you can see there, it's pretty difficult with the human brain to say, okay, if my humidity looks like this, then my heating load is gonna look like this. There doesn't, this isn't obvious to us, uh, but this is the real data as collected in this example. We can fit a neural network model, or this artificial neural network model here, using fitting routines and that model structure that I've just described to try and capture these very complex relationships. And so here are some of the results. We, we fit this data, uh, we fit a neural network model to this data, then we run tests to, uh, to see how well the model performs. And you can see that it performs very well when our forecast as predicted by our artificial neural network, lines up very closely uh, to the actual data that was collected. The gray uh, shaded areas represent um, represent kind of error bars or uncertainty in our forecast. But you can see for these particular days, that forecast works remarkably well. So neural networks are a great universal function approximator. When you have a bunch of input data and output data that you're trying to predict and you don't really know how to, how to map those relationships, neural networks can be a really great tool to, uh, to try and figure out if you can develop a predictive model.